Okay, welcome everybody. Um, today we're going to look at the mid block for the role of the number four and number eight. My name is Warren Eckett. I'm an FAYCD for the FA. I'm going to be joined by my two colleagues today, Ted Dead, Ted Dow, FAYCD, and Grant Tuzi, FAYCD, and Senior Assistant Women's Coach for the Women's National Team. How are you doing, guys? All good, yeah. thank you, Warren. All good. 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 Okay, so looking at the session outcomes today. So by the end of the session, we'll be looking to develop an understanding of what, when, how, and why of a mid, uh, of a mid block, considering how individual characteristics of the number four and the number eight can shape a team's strategy within a mid block, using key principles to introduce concepts of mid block defending when session designed. Okay, just gonna play a video now of uh, England DNA and what a mid block looks like to us. So we've gone through some uh, some pointers in respect to the mid block around the England DNA, going through the principles of play. So just a question to you, Ted. So what are the challenges that the game presents when out of possession in the mid block for our number four and our number eight? I think uh, prior to answering the question specifically about those two positions, that we make the, the clarification that those those numbers now refer to positions and, and styles of individual players rather than the shirt, the, the number on a player's shirt. Um, uh, uh, and we've had previous conversations about what which players we identify as as a number four, for example, or, or as a number eight. 
um, likewise a number 10, etc., etc., and so on. For me, uh, the, the challenges that can be classified in two ways. One, the generic challenges that all teams face uh, are around the mid-block defending. And then you've got the individual challenges for the, for those particular players themselves. Uh, and the challenge really is whether or not the characteristics of those players are capable of dealing with those specific challenges. So, for example, if you're talking about the eight, the ability to join in with the, the attack, to make runs forward, uh, with the four, the ability to circulate the ball, uh, keep things ticking over. But then they both got those those responsibilities uh, when they're out of possession to get back into the shape. You know, they are the heart of the shape, so to speak. Um, they occupy that central place. And we'll see later on with, with, with the practice design and the examples that we come come up with that, uh, that, that highlights that really strongly, I think, in my opinion. Okay, so just I mean, so what about more about the technical, the technical part of the four and eight, Ted? How do they differ potentially? I think, uh, I think again, from a defensive point of view, um, we associate, for example, the four position with uh, strong tackling, intercepting, um, but then that they could also be traits of, of, of a number eight. But but somebody playing it in the number eight role may may possess the other qualities. Uh, from an attacking point of view, which makes them more of an eight. I think once you look at it from an out of possession point of view, and, 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 and I personally find it quite difficult to identify specific defensive roles for individual players when the generic responsibilities of all players in the team uh, are quite evident. Uh, you know, get goal side quickly, hold your shape, think about the principles of defending, don't jump out too soon. Don't watch your teammate uh, press on their own. If they do go, support the press, etc., etc. Slide across, hold their, hold your, hold your position. Um, very, very disciplined. Both players. I think that, that that's something that would probably associate also with with the number four. I mean, I know, I, I know from your own experience, Warren, when you were at Dagenham, that um, you, you've said to me before in the past about the challenges that you were you faced when you you were first in in the management role do, do, do you remember that conversation we had yeah i do ted yeah i mean um, i was just assistant manager at, at dagenham um, a little while ago um, and one of the challenges was we went from the previous manager playing a certain style of play which is a bit more direct than we wanted to um, we had 10 games left to the end of the season and it was a case of the trade-off was well do we decide to to try and implement our style now uh, potentially with players who weren't going to fit that system or, or do we wait to the end of the season? Um, so I think, you know, the, the, we, we kind of simplified the game a little bit. We wanted to play through the thirds a little bit more. We said, let's play in opposition's half. But what we also did was we did some, you know, we, we identified players within the squad um, who could potentially play in some different positions. One of them being a the right back, we felt that he had the characteristics and the traits to be a centre midfield player, uh, a number eight in particular. And somebody who was um, who wasn't in the in the actual starting eleven, who was more of a squad player, uh, he was to come in and be our number four as a ball as a ball player. And then you know we we complemented that with we have other players around in other areas to complement that style. Um, and you know to be to we wanted to be on our front foot, up in people's faces. So we had to complement that. So the trade off was you know current you know current players inherited versus recruited players in. And obviously players in the squad existing who were utilised in a different way. So I suppose they presented some challenges in that way. But they really worked for us in the second season uh, with our four and eight being a prominent figure um, and a spine throughout our team. Uh, would you say w w the difference between uh, the players you inherited and, and the ones you eventually uh, relied on, the profile was more in possession dominant or or was it more out of possession dominant it was it was both to be honest with you ted because i think it's important that you have a balance of both you know if we want to be an effective in possession team then ultimately our security on a ball needs to be very very effective so our organizational skills needed to be needed to be you know we needed to be on top of that we had two very very quick wingers who were very good one-on-one -on -one, who would take chances who will, will take risks and ultimately if, if it didn't pay off we needed to make sure that the distances behind supporting those players was right uh, and we wasn't going to be caught vulnerable on on, on a counter attack. So I, you know, I see them as as equally as important as each other. To be honest with you, yeah, I think we'll see uh, 
certainly from some of the stills that we're going to show later, that the, the positioning of these two players, um, they're representative of the core of the team. And so the strength, the, the collective strength of the team emanates from that core. Um, so it's essential that those two players have those those qualities, the, the patience, the ability to intercept, read the game, uh, prevent turning when necessary, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, as well as obviously the the the, possess, the possessive stuff, you know, when we're in possession, they've yeah. got that, uh, that the skills and assets to to be worthwhile in in that part of the team as well. Yeah. Okay, Tuzi, do you want to share some uh, some experiences of yourself with the with the women's national team and the challenges that presented to yourself? Yeah, I, yeah, it's interesting listening to you there, guys. And I agree, Ted. It's fascinating. Now we we've got to be careful. We don't sort of pigeonhole, you know, numbers to positions. The players have got specific characteristics and, and, and strengths to, to play in each of those positions, you know, and we've got to be really careful that that we don't restrict them, you know. So typically, like you said, you know, the, the fall might be, um, you know, the ability to read the game and, and, and screen and protect and step in, whereas an eight may, may be more aggressive front foot, would want to fly out and go and press and go and, go and affect the ball, you know. It's in, in this sort of mid-block area of the pitch, it, we spoke about it, before it's, it's a real risk and, and reward, isn't it? And some some players' personal traits are where we want to want to stay in and protect, and some they want they want to go and, and fly out. So how we support that as coaches, yes, a performance end in terms of international, but also coming through the youth development system. I think I think is is, is key. Um, and we were chatting earlier, Ted, when we, and I, I think it's important when we talk about the mid block as well. Is understanding why do we go into the into a mid block? So from a youth development point of view, if I put that hat on, do we go into a Sunday game in our fourteenth fixture already thinking we're going to into a mid block, or is this something as a coach we know we've got that we can we can we can provide for players to help them support them through that through that game? If if that makes sense, I think that's 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 one thing I think is really important. Um, but from an international point of view. There's been instances where you know we've recognised moments in the game we've had to, you know, we've had to go and, and, and sit in a block and, and 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 protect, and it can be it, sometimes that can be seen as you're out of control, but actually you're not because you you know you might be, you might still be in control of the game even though you haven't got you haven't got the ball. So an example I used was back in the Euros 2017 when we played Spain. I think it was up to the last four minutes of the first half we hardly touched the ball. But actually, we were really solid in, in our shape. It was a real disciplined performance. And I remember coming in half time and, and saying, "Look, you know, we, we find you, and the players were fine. You know, the, the, the ball never got into our our 18 yard box in that whole time because we kept our discipline." And going back to your first point, but I think it's important with that, the players we had, you know, playing in our midfield at the time, were a mix of players who, who were comfortable to sit in and protect, but some players wanted to go and jump out and, and press as well because that's their that's their per personal um personal strength you know but the discipline they showed in the, in, that, in that four minutes of the game was 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 fantastic to to um to really control the game with, with, without the ball you know i think could i just add to that warren i think what Tuzi just said there about controlling the game yeah. i think more and more teams are, are, are becoming to realize that controlling the game isn't necessarily doesn't necessarily mean that you you've got the ball mm -hmm. you know a, a, a well-disciplined well-structured defensive unit can be the dominant force in the game without the ball. Um, and, and so long as they can retain that level of patience and that discipline that, that Tuzi spoke about there in the, in the example with, uh, against Spain, um, they become extremely difficult teams to beat. You know, and back in the day, the Arsenal w w w were renowned for it, you know, one nil to the Arsenal, that kind of thing. Um, but what we were seeing there wasn't boring football it was well structured well disciplined defensive units that, that had the ability to stay patient for long long periods of the game yeah, yeah. And, and, the, and why i mentioned the youth development side of it ted i think it's important that the moments in the game so it's a moment in the game when we may not need to go into into this into this mid block and while we're teaching players how to play in, in the mid block how we how we um transfer that into a game is really important yeah so, you know, so do we actually go into a game thinking that we're going to just play in the mid block because this is what the program says? But actually, the game doesn't present that that problem. It's a real, it's a real fine balance. 
Yeah, my, my reference again to my personal experience, because I'm a slightly longer in the tooth than, than you two guys. Um, I can remember the days when it was far, far simpler than it is today. You know, the terminology wasn't around. So when possession was lost, if you were high up the field and you were close to where possession was lost, your responsibility was to try and win it back. Yeah. Um, if you were on the other side of the field and possession was lost, your responsibility was to get goal side of the ball as quickly as possible and drop into some kind of structured shape. Um, nowadays, we label it mid block, low block, high press, you know, those kind of things. And I'm not knocking that. I, I, I understand that, but I, I, I do agree with you. I think there is a tendency now for coaches to, to pigeonhole games and say, today we're looking at mid block defending or low block defending or, you know, or high pressing or, and they try to be far too specific mm -hmm. about, about games when the game itself provides enough challenges um, in, in its own right. I think like Tuzi said, there are moments, aren't there? You have various different moments in a game, whether you're going after a team in a high press, whether you end up, you know, they beat, beat your high press, you end up getting into a mid block. And then ultimately they could beat that and then you could end up in a low block. So they're just moments of the game that ultimately they're defending, aren't they? You know, they're just different different areas of the pitch that you're defending to protect. And, and I think, Warren, come back to the initial question about the challenges for the four and the eight. I think mm. one generic trait that they would both possess is that ability to predict uh, when the transition is going to occur. So that, that they're already answering the what if question. What if we lose it? Uh, you know, they're, they're probably going to be, certainly in, in the case of the four, going to be too far away from the action to be involved directly in attacking play. Mm -hmm. So their responsibility will be around uh, preparing for transition and, and certainly preparing to prevent counter-attack. Uh, yeah. And be in a position where, where they can, and like I said, the core of the team, if that if that can be retained throughout both phases of, of play, whether it's in or out of possession, then then I think you've got a real good chance uh, of having some some out of possession strength. Okay, brilliant guys. Let's just move on to the next question. So again, so we're looking at what skill attributes do the four and eight require in order to overcome the challenges that the game presents. So, I mean, if we sort of think about the adaptability, uh, making decisions in a game, um, adapting to a game plan. But certainly, I think the big one for me is, would be around the transition. You know, so you've been off on the attack um, and all of a sudden now you're looking to potentially fall back into a, to a compact shape, which may take a period of time. Ted, do you want to link that into to consider around sort of the practice design element of that? Yeah, for me, transitions... Uh, an enormous factor and, and and for me an indicator of where a learner coach might be on their journey um traditionally what we would see most of the time are structured start points uh orchestrated setups if you ask some for example if you ask a coach to put on a session pressing from the front no doubt you know in my mind it would probably be a restart from a goal kick with everybody already goal side of the ball and there's 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 a screenshot that's coming up later where collectively we all all three of us thought that that England were in a defensive shape as a result of a goal kick but further investigation proved that that wasn't the case um so for me a, a simple rule of thumb in order to develop that those skills that those two players require and not just those two but but all the other players as well a uh, simple rule of thumb would be if you're coaching your team out of possession then give them the ball to start with so that they attack possession is lost and now you've got to uh guide and help them get back into some kind of structured shape uh and like on the, the opposite side of the thing would be if you want to coach a team uh, in possession then give the ball to the opposition to start with so that your team are in defensive mode first uh and and you've then you've got it all to do but but i understand why learner coaches might not opt for that to start with um, because it's quite a challenge uh, to do that. But it's an indicator for me of where they would be on their journey if they were able and willing to give that a go and and, and almost start. I remember Aaron Danks referring to it as a, as a, in a more chaotic state. Mm. Uh, Aaron re re referred to that on a previous webinar, uh, coaching, coaching from chaos as opposed to coaching from structured starts. Yeah. I mean, a lot of that's down to organisation, Ted, isn't it? You know, you've been on the attack. Uh, you know, your right winger's gone off um, and, he, and he's, you know, he's down by the byline, he loses it. Right, OK, who's going to go and press the ball? Who's going to slide across? Who's going to scream? 
you know, for, you know, quick recovery back into position. We're compact, we're around, not through. So, you know, all those things are going to happen, but they don't normally happen in that set position that we tend to work from in a practice. It's always, okay, you've got the ball. Here's our two banks of four, effectively, break them down. You know, that's not as real as it kind of sounds in training, is it? No, obviously, because you, when you've got the ball, you're trying to score a goal. And, uh, you know, players will take up positions accordingly. Uh, but when when the attack breaks down, which inevitably it will do more times than not, mm -hmm. um, you, you've now got that problem. As I mentioned earlier, you know, back in my day, if you were near enough to the ball, you would go and try and get it back. Mm -hmm. uh, or you would stop the other team trying to play forward. Uh, and that would buy critical time for your teammates to drop into hopefully a, a reasonably structured shape, which nowadays we call a mid-block. So if we've lost it high up the pitch, first of all, we would drop into a mid-block. And some of our examples later on will show the mid-block uh, morphing into a low block because the opposition managed to uh, make some progress with their attack. Um, but the defenders, uh, the team out of possession, remain patient and disciplined and just drop deeper and deeper, but keep their shape and keep their structure and, it, and inevitably are successful in getting the ball back. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, brilliant. That leads us into Tuzi, really. I mean, let's if we look at the sort of the risk and reward uh, side of things, Tuzi, do you want to expand on that a little bit for us, please? Well, it's just touching on Ted's a point, really, about the importance of transition in practice. So, so if we're looking at the attributes of the four and eight there, well, what's going to be critical is awareness, ability to read the game, and decision-making, um, sliding and intercepting or jumping and going and pressing. And all these decision-making decision -making skills will come when the game's in that chaotic state, as you just mentioned there, Ted. And if it's always sort of starting from that that sort of set position, you know, where do the players get the flow, flow of the game to be able to make those decisions? So if we're looking in the mid-block, it could naturally flow into the into a low block. So now we're defending in a low block, as Ted mentioned, or we might progress more into into a high press. But are we allow these these players to to read these situations and make decisions based upon them? It's going to be critical to to, to practice design, um, and or, and also as we touched on earlier, the, the different attributes of the players. You know, so some players physically might might want to go and gamble so it might be a risk to others but it's not for them so they know they can make the ground up quickly and they may they may be able to go and affect the ball and nick it others may be more self-aware but, but i can't so now i'm just going to sit and i'm going to screen but either of those decisions decisions sorry they need to have everybody else around them you know because so if we're going to keep that compact shape in that area of the pitch it's got to be a, a collective decision so players understanding each other's strengths and weaknesses as well as the coaches understanding them is going to be is going to be key to to to, to maintaining that shape. Yeah, Brilliant. I think. Well, if I could just add to to, to what Tuzi just said, though, that going back to that learner coach and and coaching from chaos, I also believe quite strongly that when you're introducing something new to players or or, or relatively new, um, you, you need to establish some key principles first of all, so that they've got something they can hang their hat on and and, and return to as a reliable reliable facts if you like so the work may well have to be structured to start with and orchestrated and managed mm -hmm. um, but somewhere along the line that 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 release into the chaotic state is critical in order for the, for the skills that you've just mentioned to be developed um, because you know no two situations will ever be the same mm -hmm. um, but they'll be they'll, they'll often be similar and, and then players can make those minor adjustments and that you mentioned Warren about the adaptability of players on the pitch during the game. I think that's something that I wouldn't say it's it's evidence is lacking, but I think it's something that, that collectively as a coaching fraternity, we could do better with in terms of encouraging players to make in the moment decisions based on the challenge that they're faced with at that particular moment, mm -hmm. um, rather than trying to, prescribe and predict everything that's going to happen in a game yeah yeah for sure i mean the moments in a game yeah, i mean so many different moments in a game it's hard to you know to to, to know what's coming um and you want you know, at the end of the day when they cross that line it is kind of down to the players uh, you hope you've given them un enough underpinning detail to, to know what's they're coming up against but there is moments in a game where they've got to make decisions by themselves and i just think if our practice design is done right that potentially will allow that to happen because there's more repetition and there's more 
problems that they're going to face and potentially be able to deal with because of different moments. Absolutely. Paul Holder refers to it as a football library and, and having a, as, as expansive a library as you can possibly have. Uh, at any given age, obviously, younger players, their library may not be as extensive as as a senior pro, for example. But but over time, by exposing players to more and more uh, changing scenarios, uh, that library is is, is built and, and extended so that they've got some some kind of reference. And and at the base baseline of it all is 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 that that principle that you you establish early on. Uh, it, it, with their level of understanding so that they can, they got that to hang their hat on uh, and fall back on. Okay. Brilliant guys. Okay. So this, this is a, a question for the learners really. Um, so if we're looking at individuals dictating strategy or strategy dictating style, you know, if you think about your, your four corner model, when you're trying to profile your player um, and think what that looks like in your context with the players that you're working with. So that's just for me to, to, to leave that with you to think about so then we're going to go on to center midfield player out of possession um we're going to look at the tech tac element out of possession we're looking at, we're going to obviously focus on regain through interception and then we're going to go on to recognizing pressing triggers so Tuzi, if you just want to speak around uh, the recognizing through interceptions for us please if you don't mind on a tech on a technical aspect yeah, mate, uh, look, no problem. My dog's going to go nuts in about 30 seconds when I take my wife up to the door, so apologies for that. No worries. If you hear it. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, the regains is a really important part of it. And again, going back to what we were discussing earlier around that ability to to read the game and, and, um, and intercept um, and anticipate. And then also looking at, you know, when, when you're talking about the four and eight positions, and now, okay, they might be, could be slightly different. They're different, but they could have uh, uh, players with similar or different traits playing in, in those positions. So if you're looking from a sort of four position where where players are stepping in and read and reading the game, are they triggering an attack with a pass? You know, a five, ten, fifteen, simple, simple yard pass. Whereas in the eight in the eight positions, are we are we wanting to break lines? Want, wanting to be more aggressive in terms of our play or travel forward with with the ball um, or make make corner runs to uh, third player runs etc so again linked to ted's uh, point on transition and training that, that's why it's critical that all practice have to have it you know this this ability to read and and, and, and intercept uh, in, in developers intercepting skills in um you know plays is absolutely critical because soon if i put my youth development hack back on which i tend to do one player spending as much time in, in possession of the ball as we can and as much as it's great to, to step in and, and nick possession we actually want to win possession and hold on to the ball um so i, I think it's it, it's it's it, as much as we talk about out of possession i think it's, it's it's a critical part of it yeah so again i mean we're just looking at just for instance here we're looking you know intercepting the ball to regain displays timing of you know footwork to seize possession of the ball underpinning detail Interception, obviously various heights, various surfaces, uh, using different weights, firm, clear, firm to attack. I mean, it's again, it's creating uh, creating practices that they're going to be able to practice all these things, isn't it, really, when we're considering this? It is, was it? But, but, but also, you know, appreciating that, that some players' traits will will benefit them in some of those areas more than, more than others. Like we mentioned earlier, you know, some players are really good at anticipating and reading the game and, and screening and protecting. Where other players will back themselves, you know they've got the physical capabilities to get up to the ball and press, and then and then drop back in and, and recover. So, you know, it's, it's whenever we're looking at these sort of profiles, it is really personal about the player as well as the position. If that makes sense. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. Okay. So just for you, Ted. Now, just um, we're still going to speak about the centre midfield player again on the tactical side, recognising pressing triggers. Do you just want to elaborate on that for us, please? Sure, and I think the I think the the model that we're looking at so uh, it's quite important to just mention that 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 we're seeing this this sort of nested idea of we take an element that we'd like to play, you know, the component of their makeup, uh, and then we break it down in, in, in into more detail. We have a clear understanding of, of what it means, 
um, and then there's some underpinning detail which you which you highlighted on on the previous one uh, and we could also go maybe a, a, a layer below where we if we were to take adjusting to backwards square and slow passes as the topic we could break that down uh, to even more finite detail whether whether we'd show that to the players or not I don't know um, we may just retain that information as the coach and, and and let it out as and when we need to but I think the point to make about about the players, uh, the four and the eight, they can't be brilliant at everything, mm. uh, but they need to be competent, certainly competent at most things, um, and they'll probably be strong, very strong at certain other things, which are the things that probably label them as being that that type of player. You know, uh, the world has recently lost Nobby Styles, um, part of the '66 team, and, and you know, I'm old enough to remember that. And the first time I heard about Alf Ramsey's strategy was that because he had Nobby Styles in the team, he wanted the team to try to funnel the opposition into where Nobby was so that he could he could perform the skills that he was he had at his disposal um, to the best best effect for the team. And and then and that was really the first time I mean I, I was 12 13 years of age at the time so and hearing that information that was the first time that the tactical play ever sort of impacted on me uh, and I, and I thought that was that was absolutely brilliant you know whether that whether it actually happened or not I've seen the I've seen the game several times over since then and uh, you tend to get caught up more in the uh in the euphoria of the occasion rather than the tactical elements of what went on but uh yeah, I, I get that. So he was he was particularly good at uh, pressing loose balls, pressing the poor touch. Um, you know, some of some of his tackling left a bit to be desired. Um, you know, he probably would get a few red cards in the in this this day and age. Um, but he was also a, a leader to to an extent. Although there were other leaders in the team as well, he he led more by his example than 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 anything else. Um, and he was probably the, the first player that, but when I think back, was that in holding midfield player in front of of, of the centre of the defence. Um, so, so for me, that a, a good example. There, there, there's lots of other examples that we could talk about that that are, are, are in this day and age. But, but the the information we're seeing on the screen there, that those players are are they're very very good at some of those things. Uh, and they're good at other of those things. Uh, otherwise, they wouldn't be in the position they, they, they're in at the moment. Yeah, agreed. I think on that as well, Ted, it's a skill that you know, we we often don't talk about is the communication side of it, and, and it's, on, it's on one of the – it's on the bottom line there. So when you're looking at the midfield players, particularly in this mid-block, how they control players in front of them to, 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 to protect them and, and, and keep play away from them, and I think that's um, – that, that's a real skill in itself, you know, and I know on a couple of clips that we got later, the, the front players are working ever so hard and, and they, they, they're being controlled by the midfielders behind them, which in turn it keeps a really, really compact shape. Well, people talk about the spine of the team, don't don't they? And, and I would imagine that, that the point you've just made there, Tuzi, about, you know, the goalkeeper would control his, his, his central defenders. Central defenders control the central midfield players. Central midfield players control the players in front of them, uh, and, and that spine of the team gives gives you that core strength that we that we spoke about earlier. Yeah, yeah. Okay, brilliant, guys. Okay, we're now just going to watch a video. What does this look like within the game?
Brilliant. So Brilliant. Just, just going just through yeah. there, yeah. um, what I would say uh, that that means to me, certainly, would, you know, in a transition moment, uh, the team's attacking, certainly with the first clip, team's attacking, falls back into a mid-block. Um, I mean, that takes discipline, patience and organisations. So from the organised chaos that Ted was speaking about before, to then dropping back into a to a nice shape after pressing and putting some pressure on the ball. Um, once, the, you know, potentially the team's going to break your mid-block. You see the teams, some of them falling back into a to a low block. But what I think the consistent message throughout high, mid and low was the four and eight always staying connected through the spine of the team, getting up to the ball when possible with a real compact shape. So now if I just pass you over to you, Ted, if we can just go through some practice design. Sorry, uh, Tuzi, sorry. If we can just go through some, some practice design examples uh, what that could look like. Yes, mate. If you, if you, can you click it on there? Yeah, this this really quickly, really, because Ted's going to talk into um, his practice design, but just the, the simplicity of using goals as constraints. So particularly when we're working in the mid-block, this was a, a session I did on a recent um, A-license course, actually. Mm -hmm. So just by positioning the, the one goal on the on three-quarter length pitch, it allow you to just really work on your shape, so side to side across the across the pitch, and really looking at well, how do we limit gaps between lines between players, um, and just the practice design allowed you to do it, you know. And then if you click on the next one, click on the next slide. There you go, man. Now when it when the, the it goes to the the full pitch, how you identify well now the. Now the issue is how do we now check the spaces between units as the game starts to, starts to stretch out. So I, I just think no matter you know, what sort of formation you're playing in, um, even if you're doing uh, you know, sm smaller side games, I guess, if you're working in the 12s or the 13s and you're working in a 9v9 or, or, or the 7v7, whatever it may be, I just think this concept of using the goals as a constraint to, to, as a real simple vehicle to, to allow you to... to to develop the areas you're going after. So like I say, show the pitch, we're going to work side to side to protect the gaps across the pitch, open the pitch up. Now as the pitch as the pitch opens up, can we really protect um, spaces in, in between units? And and that's where you start to get this, this risk for rewards stuff then as well, was you know, do the yeah. people start going and pressing, um, isolate because because now there's more more more, more space on the pitch and then how the gaps start to, to open up in between the units. Yeah, that's quite a clever way to see how to go after it. It just splits it into two, you know, you know, just just by moving a goal, you can go into two, two different parts of the press, like you've spoken about. Yeah, and I just think it allows you just to stand back then and, and observe, you know. Mm. Okay. So if you want to just talk us through um, a coach decision making model and then obviously on to your, to your practice designs, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, so. so uh, my practice, the motivation behind my practice design was was different to to Tuzi's. Mine, I looked at mine from a point of view of maybe introducing it for the first time to a, a group of young players who are in in the YD uh, YD phase, um, on the assumption that they've come from the foundation phase with certain terminology that they're familiar with. Um, this is just part of the the A license playbook now that that, that we're using. So we're just showing people how you know what sort of impact we think our session might have, and how we thought about uh, areas that we would impact uh, as we're constructing the work. Um, working off this defensive model, a fairly generic model, uh, I, I've taken this from the from the England DNA one and just sort of expanded it slightly to to stretch it further up the pitch. That there's there's nothing new on there, uh, and I make no. Um, there's no shame, I think, in taking that from from, from the DNA model, and and uh, quite rightly so, I think. Um, I used the England versus Wales game, the recent one, as my basis for evidence and justifying why I did the practice the way I did it. Um, and we'll see from a, in a moment from some stills that that how we've linked it to the reality of the game. Um, so this is the still I spoke about earlier on, where you can see England are in a nice tidy shape. Uh, they've chosen to go with five at the back when they're out of possession. They've chosen to have a front three when they're out of possession. And then their four and eight are holding uh, the middle shape uh, where we see the referee in the centre circle there. 
what your shape looks like out of possession is entirely up to you. It's entirely uh, down to preference. It can be dictated to by the, the, the attributes of the players that we've already mentioned um, and, and who's available to you at the time and, uh, and so on. Um, I think it's important to stress that at this, this point here, we um, all three of us thought that this example came from a goal kick situation for Wales, uh, when actually the evidence showed that the Welsh had the ball for 20 seconds. England had it first, lost it, and then it took 20 seconds to get England back into this position. Now, I'm not suggesting that that's a long time, but what I am suggesting is that something else was going on during that period of time to enable England to get back into this shape. And that, of course, was some of their players were pressing the ball, forcing the ball backwards and sideways. Um, in, in principle of, of defending terms, that's called delay. Uh, buying time for your teammates to drop back in and, and get into their shape. And I think it, if people took the time to replay uh, the video, they would see that the core of the team uh, was always always in, in the positions, not exactly where they are at the moment, but were always holding that, that centre of the field position, um, looking at the what-if scenarios, so that when they did eventually lose possession, um, they had some, some core strength to build upon. So just labelling the players there, there's the Welsh players, and then we can see that England have dropped into, I call it, they collapsed, into three defensive lines. And, and that's a word I think should travel from the foundation phase into the next phase. Players should come with that familiarity around the word collapse and what it means in you know from a footballing point of view in terms of defending. Three defensive lines. Um, in terms of the dimensions of a block, whether it's a mid block or low block, I've tried to simplify the idea and present that principle that the width of the block would be roughly half of the pitch and the length of the block would be roughly half of the length of half of the pitch, otherwise known as a quarter of the pitch. Um, so from front to back and from side to side, we've got some sort of some ideas and the five lanes on the field also help us with that, um, how we might perceive that to look like. Now, if we transfer that to this England example, we can see that you know, that would roughly be the dimensions front to back, side to side of the block uh, and the shape that England have adopted uh, on this particular occasion means that their shape would look something like that. So they're quite narrow in the middle, but they have the, the benefit of additional width at the back and also by deploying three front players where often teams will only have one central striker. Um, they've got that uh, added ability to drive the ball wide quite early on. And we, again, if you play this clip back, um, you'll see that the Welsh team uh, play the ball from side to side, from right to left, left to right on a number of occasions without succeeding uh, in breaking down England's, England's shape. Again, but roughly half the width of the pitch and, and I've called it half the length of half the pitch. I know that that means a quarter but I just like the the terminology of the half 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 rule um I think you know young players particularly would remember that uh, a little bit easier collapsing into three lines we can see the three lines again and then we bring that into the 2d diagram uh with the players again just mentioned the, the benefit of having five at the back and the benefit of the three up front showing the four, the lines of force that we we try to force the opposition to do now on a personal note i like to i like to bring practices into what i call the micro or the mini shadow i remember many years ago probably uh les reed won't want to remember it but i certainly do when les first showed me a mini shadow it was at bisham abbey uh and i was absolutely uh i fell in love with the idea there and then and introduced it uh, in my days at chelsea and all the teams all the players were very very familiar with what a mini shadow meant and it was it was a uh, almost like a human tactics board where we had the opportunity to where we had the opportunity to um, deal with situations or, or in this miniature version. Okay, uh, at some stage in the practice, we would need to look at transition, um, and again, I would do that first in 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 the in the the uh, mini environment. 
then the big the big thing is to transfer the principles across the pitch uh, onto the big arena and examine the impact of distances and individual responsibilities and collective responsibilities of the players with a particular focus although in in the diagram they're wearing number seven and number eight um our our four if you like was harry winks he's wearing number seven and our eight is wearing number eight uh, uh the boy phillips the the existence of the opposition uh they're labeled by by letters there i would station them around the practice um and ask them to keep transferring the ball from there to there and we'll just say for the moment can you can you just remain in fixed positions so i've referred to them as static opposition remain in fixed positions and and the white white players uh, would just slide across uh we'd have an engager who engages goes goes and presses the ball look at the role of the first engager the second engager support players uh in particular and then at some stage we'd have to identify the importance i've called it the box sometimes it's a triangle but for generic reasons i've referred to it as center circle defending so although we're attacking down the right hand side and in this instance we've got uh trippier in, has got the ball high on the right hand side uh, we would expect some kind of presence in and around the center circle and my preference would be for a box um a box shape and I've also tried to identify who would be in the box, which which people, which personnel would actually actually uh, form the box. And in this occasion, because Gomez has gone high to support Trippier on the right hand side, the box would be made up of Keane and Cody, Winks and Phillips. Um, but the circumstances of the game are going to affect that and change that uh, on a number of occasions. But the players would have the principle. Uh, to hang their hat on and return to, uh, which the importance of which I referred to earlier on in the discussion. And then finally, we take it into a game 11 v 11. The opposition are unrestricted and circumstances will be thrown up by what goes on in the game. And finally, we would just use this model as a, a check and balance model, uh, basically saying to ourselves, did we achieve what we wanted to get out of the practice? Um, and uh, many people now are, are becoming more and more familiar with this model that's a common model uh, amongst us uh, in the FAYCD team. That's it. Thank you. Ted, just touching on the on the slides that you've presented to us, you know, really clever way of doing it. I mean, what you've put together has actually come from the game. You know, you haven't made it up. It's literally players in the exact positions from some still shots. So, you know, the power of, of the analysis is great. And then, you know, coaches... Lots of coaches have got access to that. And, you know, you can actually create real sessions from that footage, which which you've just shown. I think it's, you know, it's fascinating now how you can do that. You don't necessarily have to make sessions up. They're there for you. Just take a little bit of time to study the game, look at the positions and analyse like you have. Uh, yeah, and I, I think that's a really valid point, Warren. Uh, and unfortunately, I, I, you know, I no longer work with players on a regular basis, which is something I miss tremendously. But... But many of the people we work with and support do have access to footage of their own players, so can use that as their as their baseline for for practice design. Um, and also, where need, they could use first team examples, England team examples of, you know, like like we've done in in here. We've shown uh, clear examples of, of a very structured way of defending in the middle part of the field. Um, for me, like I mentioned earlier, the key thing is the the transitional, the 20 seconds before you get into that shape, what's going on there. And I think that's the key to the coaching is that the players have to understand that, that someone's got, you know, some jobs have to be done as a priority. So in order for us to achieve that, that mid-block shape and, and the strength of that shape, something has to happen first to buy us the time to do that. Yeah. And if, during that effort, you know, that attempt to buy time, we actually win the ball back even better, even, you know, then, then so be it. And we go on the attack again. Okay. Brilliant. Okay. Thanks guys. That takes, that brings us to the end of, uh, of our session now, hopefully, um, you know, the guys have unpacked the things that we said it was going to go after from the start, the what, the how, the why, um, you know, certain individual characteristics of the number four and the number eight, 
the challenges the game may present, uh, the skill attributes to it as well. And then certain, and certainly Ted sort of give us an insight into the, the, the session design around that. So I'd just like to thank uh, Ted and Tuzi for their, you know, insights and expertise and sharing their experiences with us today. Cheers, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Warren. Thanks, Tuzi. Cheers, Warren. Thanks, Brilliant. Ted.